What's the use of stories that aren't even true? So asks author Salman Rushdie in his remarks on the importance of storytelling in his January 14th appearance at UVM's Ira Allen Chapel. Thank you. Well, it's nice of you all to come out in such numbers to listen to a writer speak. There's no reason why writers should be able to do this. And in, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes or so, you may come to that conclusion. Uh, I wanted to just talk about this, this strange business of storytelling. I mean, we are, I've, I've said before, but I think it's worth repeating that we are the only creature on the earth that does this very unusual thing of telling itself stories in order to try and understand what kind of creature it is. Um, we are, you could say, the storytelling animal. And some of these stories are true stories, some of them are sacred stories, some of them are national stories, some of them are family stories, some of them are stories we make up. Um, but what we try and do, we are a very narrative inclined animal. Uh, we understand things better if they're told to us in a story than if they're presented analytically. And this is why novels sell better than works of philosophy, I'm happy to say. Um, um, that thing, the centrality of the story to us as people, is, is very evident from the beginning of life. You know, when, with, when children are born, once they feel loved and safe and warm, with a roof over their heads, one of the first things they do, the moment they can speak, is to ask for a story. And, and so that desire to be told the world, you know, to have the world told to you, and for you to respond to that and see how well you can understand that, is there from the very beginning of our lives. And as a result, I've always been one of those writers who feels that that story narrative is very important to place at the center um, of, a, of a novel. There is, there is, I mean, these days, I have to say, there's a, there's a slightly, there's a sort of fashionable trend away from that, away from the idea of narrative as being at the center. And um, I'm old enough to know that fashion goes round and round, and you basically, the best thing you can do to it is ignore it, <laughs> as you see. <laughs> um, but um, I've always thought, particularly if you're writing, I mean, I've written one or two quite long books, and, and I, my feeling is, if you're going to write, if you're going to make a big car, put a big engine in it. Um, that if you underpower the car, it doesn't matter how cool it looks, it doesn't go very well. And the story is the engine of the, of the text, in my view, and, and so I've always been very interested in how that works and why. And going back into, in time to look at early stories, I've always been very interested in fairy tale and folk tale and in what in the East are collectively known as, as, as wonder tales. Um, I was, as a young writer, very influenced by uh, my friend, the great English novelist Angela Carter, who sadly passed away some years ago. Angela was enormously knowledgeable about fairy tale and folk tale, and in her, in her own writing made much use of deviant, variant forms. So in her collection, The Bloody Chamber, she retells, oh, Beauty and the Beast, Snow White, Little Red Riding Hood, in ways that their original tellers would not have recognized, largely because they're much sexier and much more violent. Uh, both are improvements. Um, um, she had, Angela had a very interesting dis definition of the difference between the European folktale uh, as best represented by the, by the Grimm stories and, by, and the English folktale. And what she said is it's the difference between the wood and the forest. German stories, the stories of the Brothers Grimm, come from the Black Forest. 
The forest is dark and deep. You can get lost in it. There can be monsters hiding in it. There can be witches waiting to cook little children. Um, the English wood is a much smaller place. You always know where the edge of it is. You don't get lost. The fairies are small and they hide under toadstools. Um, so the English folktale is little. The German folktale is big and dark. And Angela moved between the two. And in my, I mean, I always added a third, you know, a third leg to that, to that stool, which is the, the enormous storehouse of, of folktale, mythology, legend, that becomes what you're given um, as, as your heritage if you grow up in India, as I did. Um, these stories are very extraordinary because for a start, they're rather more amoral than their Western counterparts. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But that idea that the fable doesn't have to end in a neatly tied up moral, you know, don't be greedy. Um, and it suggests to you that the bad guys can sometimes win. That's very useful information um, because true. Um, so that was that material was all part of the the, the fabric of, of where my work came from, and it was added to it. To it was added one more thing, which is that in India, um, an oral tradition of storytelling is still alive and well. Let's say in, in here in in the West, by and large, oral narration has died out as a kind of mass form. Um, but in India, you can, particularly in South India, you, you can still get oral storytellers who can command very significant audiences. I mean, you know, thousands of people come to hear them perform. And I've been to listen to one or two of these, and there's something very remarkable about, the, about what happens in these stories, because they do not observe the rules of what we are told is classical form. And that's perhaps best expressed in the advice given by the King of Hearts to a very flustered white rabbit in the court scene of Alice, when the white rabbit isn't clear how he should, how he should tell his story. And the King of Hearts says, start at the beginning, go on until you reach the end, and then stop. <laughs> That's, if you like, classical form in a nutshell. But what happens in the oral storytelling tradition is that's exactly what doesn't, that, how it's not told. The storyteller will introduce a storytelling motif which is often taken from legend and mythology. He will almost immediately digress and compare that story to some contemporary political scandal. Um, and then he'll digress from that to, to tell you a personal story about his relationship with his wife. Um, then he may well break into a song and dance routine, um, tell you a couple of jokes about nothing in particular. And so you have four or five different performative th threads interweaving all the time. And you keep waiting for him to lose the thread, but he never does. The art of the storytelling is that all the balls are kept in the air. And just when you think he's going to drop the ball, he introduces another narrative thread and manages to keep that juggled up in the air as well. Now, here's the thing that's, that you're, that's remarkable about this, because what we are told classically is that if you talk like that, your audience gets confused and loses um, and ceases to pay attention. But actually, what the oral narrative shows us is that that's a way of keeping the audience interested. The audience loves the juggling act and goes along with it. And of course, the oral storyteller knows exactly when he loses his audience, because the audience gets up and walks away. <laughs> or else, if they really don't like it, they start throwing things. You know, so, so the art of the oral story is to keep the audience sitting there and not throwing things. And, and so 
it seemed to me, listening to this, that maybe that this was actually a better way of telling a story than what the King of Hearts said to the White Rabbit. And I've tried to do that as a result with mixed results. Um, one of the things you discover as a writer over the years is that the things people like about your writing, who like your writing, are exactly the things that the people who don't like your writing don't like about your writing. <laughs> and that even comes down to the level of the sentence. There can be, I've had more than once the experience of a good piece about my work referring to a certain sentence as proof of why the, why the book is good. And in another piece, the same sentence being used as evidence of why the book is bad. So there we are. That's why I say, the hell with it. You know, you just do your stuff. But this, this has also been, so this, not just the folk tale, the fairy tale, the wonder tale, but actually the oral tale. These have all been a part of how I've come to be a writer. And of course, in Harun and the Sea of Stories, that question of the oral narrative is very much in the foreground because the, one of the main characters, Harun's father, Rashid Khalifa, is an oral storyteller um, who, who, who loses the gift of the garab. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I came to, uh, to, to write this, the, my version of the wonder tale, if you like. And it started, of course, with this level of interest. So that been, had been sort of bubbling around in my head anyway. And then it just started with a, with a I don't know, request is too polite a term to put it, instruction from my son, who said rather scathingly, why don't you ever write a book that I want to read? <laughs> uh, he was 10. So I thought, oh, well, you know. And I, I remember there's a line in a song by Paul Simon, a song called St. Judy's Comet, which is kind of a lullaby. Um, in, in which he sings, if I can't sing my boy to sleep, it makes your famous daddy look so dumb. Look so dumb. And I thought, well, if I can't write a story that my child likes, what kind of a writer am I? And so I said to him, well, look, I'm just in the middle of this novel right now. It's a big, long, difficult novel. Let me just finish the novel. And then the next book I write, I'll write a book that you might like to read. And th that novel was The Satanic Verses. And <laughs> And uh, it had somewhat complicating effect on, on, uh, on, on my life and on his. And, and so I thought, well, given how complicated our lives had become, one of the things I should do is keep that promise. Uh, and so I did. And it mo really motivated me to get back to writing, and, and I'm grateful for it. Also, I have to say, that he gave me perhaps the most useful piece of literary criticism uh, that I ever received. When I'd written about, I don't know, 25, 30 pages of it, of a first draft, I thought, I better, you know, I better just check that, that, <laughs> that, that it's going down all right. So I, I gave it to him to read. And when he'd read it, I said, what do you think? And he said, he said yeah, yeah no, it's, it's good, Dad. I, I like it. And I sensed a certain lack of enthusiasm there, you know. So, so, so I said, really, you, you think it's all right? You like it? And he said, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd read it. He said, you know, some people, Dad, some people might be bored. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, bored? <laughs> and why? And he used this wonderful phrase. He said, well, it doesn't have enough jump. It doesn't have enough jump in it. I thought, jump? Yeah, he said, jump. Doesn't have, it doesn't have enough jump. And I, you know, I kind of understood exactly what he meant. And I thought, I can do jump. <laughs> you know, <laughs> give me that back. You know? <laughs> so I took it back and I sort of rewrote it and showed it to him again. And now, more or less through clenched teeth, I said, so what do you think of it now? <laughs> Um, and he said, no, now it's great. And it was really very clarifying and helpful, the, that piece of advice. So, um, so I owe him that as well. Um, 
There's one of the great things, I mean, I think, yes, it was E.B. White, E.B. White who wrote Charlotte's Web, you know, and, um, said when asked about writing for children, he said, you don't write down for children, you write up. Um, it, the young readers are very, very demanding readers. When they like it, they really like it. When they don't like it, they really don't like it. And they don't bother to finish books that they don't like, uh, and they tell you why they don't like them. All of this is hurtful and upsetting. So, so if possible, when writing for children, write a good book. Um, <laughs> it's less painful. Uh, um, but one of the things I wanted, I felt from the beginning writing Haruna the Sea of Stories is that I didn't feel that I was writing only for younger readers. I, I wanted to write a book which, as it were, spoke in two voices at the same time. And that younger readers, I mean, my son was 11, 12 when it came out, um, that, they, that, that, that kids of that age could read it and get their, the pleasures that they wanted and that grown-ups could read it and, in a way, see a different book there. And, and, and I thought, you know, there's a... If you look at what's happened in the movies, there's an enormous amount of cinema now about which you don't even ask yourself the question whether it's for grown-ups or children, because it's kind of for everybody. Um, I mean, I don't know, Star Wars. You know, who framed Roger Rabbit? I mean, there's an end, endless um, list of, of these movies. And I thought there must be a a way of doing that in prose fiction as well, where, where, the sub, where the question of the reader in a way becomes unimportant. Anybody who picks it up is the reader. And that, in a way, it, it, it gave the hardest part of writing Haroon and the Sea of Stories was trying to find that tone of voice, trying to find the place where the story should be, the language should be pitched I mean, I would write passages and they would seem too childish for adults. I would write passages that would seem too adult for younger readers. And it was very, very difficult to find that line that went in between. And in the end, the thing that really helped me was going back to think about these old stories, the fables, the folk tales. Because one of the great characteristics about the fable is that the fable is usually written in very simple language, but it's not about very simple things. So it's a, it's a way to say complicated things in very simple, clear terms. And many years later, I, I had a conversation with the great American writer Joseph Heller, who you know, wrote Catch-22. Um, and he said to me that very many of his books had begun because he thought of a sentence and that he knew that that sentence gave him a couple of hundred other sentences. And he said, Catch-22 began like that. You know, it was love at first sight, the moment he saw, Yossarian, Yossarian saw the chaplain, he fell in love with him. So, oh, okay, I get it. Book goes like this. His next novel, Something Happened, began, he, he wrote down the sentence, in the office in which I work, there are five people of whom I'm afraid which ended up being actually the beginning of chapter two, but it was the kind of open sesame that gave him the book. And certainly that little, that couple of sentences, the, it's not so much what the sentences say as the note that they hit that made me think, okay, I get it. And then I do have this sort of sense of writing, which is almost musical, where I think you have a note, it's like having a tuning fork. And as long as you can hit that note, once you find out what note you're trying to hit, as long as you can hit that note and hear that you're doing it, then the book is probably going okay. And that's really how this book began, that by, by finding the tone of the, of, the, of, the, of the fable. The story itself, oddly, came almost fully formed. It's very rare for me that that happens, that the story just kind of plops into your head. Um, the sea of stories, the idea of the sea of stories, uh, the idea that there's a sea which contains all the stories in the world, all kind of flowing in and out of each other. Um, that was partly my invention. I mean, yeah, actually, it was more than partly my invention. Um, but it does come from, the phrase comes from uh, a, an ancient collection of stories um, 
written in Kashmir in Sanskrit, a very long time ago, much older than the Arabian Nights, which in Sanskrit is called the Katha Sarit Saga, which means Katha story, Sarit stream, Saga ocean, the, the ocean of the streams of story. Is, is what, and, and in that book, it, there, there isn't an ocean. It's just, it's just a compendium of stories, and that's just the title it's given. But it made me think, suppose there was an ocean. Suppose there was an ocean and that the stories came from there. And when my son Zafar was young, Harun being his middle name, by the way, um, I used to tell him stories, not so much in bed, but when he was in the bath. I used to tell him bath time stories. And so the bath, you know, the smaller version of the sea. Um, and I would do this thing where I would dip a mug into the water and pretend that it contained a story and sip it and then tell him the story. You know, so, so I had that made up that idea that stories could be held in liquid form. Um, in, during when he was a little boy and I was telling him these, these stories. And so that gave me, if you like, the sort of central metaphor of, of the book. And uh, the other, the kind of narrative heart of the book, which is this battle between these two worlds, one of which is dedicated to chatter and gossip and conversation, etc., and the other of which is dedicated to darkness and silence, and etc. It actually came out of a story that I had written several years earlier and never published because I thought there was something wrong with it. I had written a story which had nothing to do with Haroon or his father or the Earth's second moon or any of that nonsense. Um, just a story about these two, these two communities at war with each other. And, and when I finished it, I thought, I don't like this very much. I don't, I, there's something that's not working here. And I put it away in a drawer and literally forgot about it. And then when I began to write Haroon, I suddenly remembered that story and I thought, oh, those people belong here. You know, it's like 10 years later, I found out where they belonged. And I fortunately managed to find the file containing the first draft of the story, and that gave me a lot of the central uh, narrative. Um, the idea of the sea of stories, I think it's worth just reading you a little bit, so, you, so those of you who haven't yet got to page 71, <laughs> um, which of course I can tell from your laughter that you all have got to page 71, <laughs> so, so you're just going to have to hear it for a second time, but for the three or four people in the audience who haven't got to page 71, this is uh, if the water genie telling Harun about the ocean of the streams of story. Harun, this is Harun, looked into the water and saw that it was made up of a thousand, thousand, thousand and one different currents, each one a different color, weaving in and out of one another like a liquid tapestry of breathtaking complexity. And if, the water genie explained, that these were the streams of story, that each colored strand represented and contained a single tale. Different parts of the ocean contained different sorts of stories. And as all the stories that had ever been told and many that were still in the process of being invented could be found here, the ocean of the streams of story was in fact the biggest library in the universe. And because the stories were held here in fluid form, they retained the ability to change, to become new versions of themselves, to join up with other stories, and so become yet other stories. So that unlike a library of books, the ocean of the streams of story was much more than a storeroom of yarns. It was not dead, but alive. And if you are very, very careful, or very, very highly skilled, you can dip a cup into the ocean, if told Haroon, like so. And here he produced a little golden cup from another of his waistcoat pockets. And you can fill it with water from a single pure stream of story, like so, as he did precisely that. And then you can offer it to a young fellow who's feeling blue, so that the magic of the story can restore his spirits. Go on now, knock it back, have a swig, do yourself a favor. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Um, now, of course, as I mentioned, this, you know, nothing comes from nothing. Books come from other books, stories come from other stories. And I just want to say a little bit about the animal fables, because the animal fables, as I said at the beginning, uh, they're, they're, they're wonderfully cynical. Um, because there is absolutely no idea that good should triumph. Um, uh, the collection, the most famous of these collections is, is, a, is called the Panchatantra. And it features as main characters a pair of talking jackals. Um, one of them is called Karataka, who is the good, well, he's not the good guy exactly, but he's, he's the better guy. And, and the other one is called Damanaka, who is the, the more wicked, scheming one of the two. They're the heroes, uh, not the villains. And at the book's outset, they, they find themselves in the service of the Lion King, not that Lion King. <laughs> um, but Damanaka doesn't like it that the lion is also friendly with another courtier who is a, a bull. And he tricks the lion into believing that the bull is an enemy and a spy. And uh, the lion king then murders the perfectly innocent bull while the jackals watch. The end. <laughs> um, it, it, so in these tales, uh, you, you also read about, um, there's a story about a war between the crows and the owls. And one crow pretends to be a traitor and joins the owls to discover the location of the cave where the owls live. Then the crows set fire at all the entrances to the cave and the owls all suffocate to death. The end. <laughs> um, in a third story, a man leaves his child in the care of his friend. His friend is a mongoose. And when he returns, he sees blood on the mongoose's mouth and kills it, believing that it has attacked his child. Then he discovers that the mongoose has actually killed a snake that was threatening the child and saved the child. But by now, the mongoose is unfortunately deceased. The end. <laughs> um, you see, if you compare this to Aesop's fables with their little morality tales about the victory of dogged slowness, you know, and the, 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 the tortoise over the hare, or the, the foolishness of crying wolf, or, um, or killing the goose that laid the golden eggs, it all seems positively drippy when compared to this Quentin Tarantino savagery. You know? <laughs> I mean, so much for the cliched stereotype of the peaceful, mystical East. Um, so, you see, that's, that's where I got it from, um, that stuff. Um, to take the manner of the fable, but to remove the soppy moral. So you don't, you're not telling people how to feel or how to behave or how to think. You're using the manner, but without preaching at them. And I think that, oddly, these ancient stories, oddly, are very modern in that respect, in that they're so lacking in didacticism. They don't try, uh, they don't try to um, teach you things. They just try to show you things that are true um, about, about human nature and jackal nature and so on. Well. Something was happening in my life at the time that I was writing this book. As I said, this was, the book was written within the year after the attack on my earlier novel, The, the Satanic Verses, uh, which had caused you know, an upheaval, not just in my life, but in my family's life. And I, I wanted to address that for my son in a way that he could understand. And so much of the central narrative of the book is about a battle between, if you like, between language and silence, between the virtues of speech and the fear of speech being stifled. Um, the villain of the novel is somebody seeking to stifle um, speech. One of the devices that I thought would help him to 
to understand it uh, was that I made a reversal in the book of the standard relationship between adults and children, which is that adults, mothers and fathers, protect their children. In this book, it's very much the child who sets out to save his father and who becomes uh, the protagonist of the story. And first of all, I thought that would give him a good feeling. It would allow him to think about his father as he did think about his father, which is somebody more or less useless. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, emphasize his own self-image, which is that obviously he would be the person in charge. Um, and it just made the book more enjoyable to write that way around. Um, there's also the question of, now most of you will have finished the book so I can talk about the ending, right? Uh, uh, the point, by the way, is the book begins, the dynamic of the story begins when Haroon's parents separate. When his wife runs, out with a, runs off with a rather unfortunate individual. Um, who later seems to be echoed in the villain of the story. Um, and I, when I first wrote it, I thought, well, maybe, you know, modern children's stories are very tough-minded about the way in which they teach children about the world. And maybe what I have to do is write it in such a way that by the end of the story, Haroon has learned to accept the fact that his parents are no longer together, and he just sort of has to deal with it. But once the book got underway, the momentum of the story demanded that I didn't do that. Um, it demanded, in, in, as stories do, that the thing that is broken in the beginning has to be unbroken by the end. And so I had to write, rather unusual for me, a happy ending. Um, a fully-fledged, unequivocal, happy ending. And I think the reason I was able to do it is that something had happened in my life which made me very interested in the subject of happy endings, um, which were by no means at all clear that that's what, that's what would happen to me. So I became very anxious to make it up. And it's, it's I mean, I think it's a pretty damn good happy ending, actually. And, and uh, it makes me want to do more of it. Um, I haven't really succeeded that well, except in the sequel that I wrote 18 years later to Haroon when I wrote Luca and the Fire of Life for, for, for my second son, who kept, until I wrote it, who would say, where's my book? <laughs> and, 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 and now the two of them argue about which book is better. Um, but they are the two books which have happy endings. So this is the advantage of children. They make you, they make you come up with stuff that wouldn't, doesn't actually come naturally. Um, Haroon is my son Zafar's middle name. When I first wrote the book, he was quite displeased that I had not used his first name. Now he's incredibly relieved. <laughs> that he has a little bit of distance um, from the book. Um, and as I say, the book achieved its goal, um, which was to tell him a story at two different ages. Tell him a story as a child and tell him a story as a grown-up. And even though the words were the same, the story was read differently. And so all I can say is read it twice. Who was it? I think I don't know. It might have, I think it's Nabokov. Might not be. Who said that if a book's not worth reading twice, it's not worth reading once? <laughs> so you know, obviously, you'll all read it twice. Um, I just want to finish this part by saying that something about this book about about literature itself and what it seeks to do uh, to the reader. What art tries to do is to increase, by some degree, the sum total of what it is that we know, what it is that we understand, 
what it is that we see, and therefore, in the end, what it is possible for us to be. And depending on the genius of the artist, the, the degree to which it expands our minds, you know, is greater or smaller. Um, but all serious art, I believe, tries to do that. It tries to open the universe. And um, first of all, that's not easy to do. And secondly, I think that to do that, well, put it like this, you can't do that by sitting safely in the middle ground. To push the boundaries outwards, you actually have to go to the boundaries and push. Um, and so to, you know, to increase frontiers, you must go to the frontier and seek to widen the frontier. And that's risky business. Frontiers, as we know, are dangerous places. And uh, also, there are plenty of people, powerful people, in the world who don't want the universe opened up a little more, who in fact would rather prefer it to be shut down. Uh, and so, artists who go to that edge and push outwards often find very powerful forces pushing back. They find the forces of silence opposing the forces of speech, the forces of censorship against the forces of utterance. At that boundary is that push and pull between more and less. And that push and pull can be very dangerous to the artist. And many artists have suffered terribly for that. And yet, somehow, their work very often is victorious. I mean, that's to say, you go back to early days, the poet Ovid wrote something that Caesar Augustus didn't like. We're not even sure what it was that annoyed Caesar Augustus, but something did. And so Ovid was exiled to, the, to a dreadful little dump of a village on the shores of the Black Sea and was never allowed to come back to Rome. He wrote endless, piteous letters asking to come back to Rome and was never allowed to do so. And so his life was you know, badly damaged and he, and he died in, in exile. And yet, the poetry of Ovid has outlasted the Roman Empire. The poet Mandelstam annoyed Stalin by writing a funny poem about Stalin. Stalin not known for his sense of humor. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and as a result, Mandelstam spent his life in labor camps and eventually died in one. And yet, the poetry of Mandelstam has outlasted the Soviet Union. You could say the same about Lorca. Lorca killed by Franco's phalange, but the poetry of Lorca has outlasted the Spanish dictatorship. So what we see from this is that art has incredible resilience and strength, but artists are weak and vulnerable and need protection and often suffer terribly for this attempt to push against the forces of darkness and limitation. And yet, every artist worth the name, I think, would agree that in spite of those difficulties, in spite of that battle against silence, doing this, going to the frontier and pushing outwards, that's the job. Thank you. All right, settle down. You'll have another chance. <laughs> okay. uh, some of my students here at the University of Vermont have uh, read the book and wrote some questions that I wanted to share with you. And, okay. And feel free to answer. Um, in thinking about opening up the universe a little bit more, one student asked, does reaching such a large audience change how you approach your work in order to better connect with a larger readership? You know, truthfully, it, it doesn't affect how I do it at all because 
I never expected my books to have a large audience. You know, I mean, at the time that I finished Midnight's Children and it got a publisher, I thought it'll be nice if, like, a couple of thousand people who are not related to me, uh, <laughs> you know, end up, end up buying it. I mean, the idea that it was going to have this colossal global, you know, life never remotely crossed my mind. And, and these books are not written in the way that bestsellers are ordinarily written. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not, they're not, I'm sorry to say, they don't rise to the level of Dan Brown. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, what's her name with her, with her shades of grey. Um, um, I, mean, I remember, you know, somebody asked, I remember Umberto Eco, after the enormous, gigantic success of The Name of the Rose, um, was asked about this question, about, you know, how does this enormous audience um, affect your writing? And he said, I'll tell you how to write a bestseller. First, you set it in a monastery <laughs> so that there's no sex. <laughs> then you make it about very abstruse intellectual philosophy because that's really popular. <laughs> and then you make sure that there are large slabs of Latin. <laughs> and that's the clincher. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, I think... Echo was probably quite surprised yeah. with what happened to the day with the rose. <laughs> I mean, and see, in, in the case of this book in particular, I was really writing it for one person. Mm. You know, I mean, I was trying to please one person. Mm. As I say, in my mind, I was trying to please one person at two points in his life. You know, um, and I just thought that the particular leads to the general. If you can please. Mm that one child, you please many children. If you, if you can please that one adult, then maybe many other adults. But, but I was literally, I've seen only, I mean, these books, the two books I wrote for my sons, are the only books about which I would say that, that I had a very, very clear audience in mind, and it was an audience of one, you know? And um, fortunately, a few other people read it too. <laughs> There's, you talked about the tales and their influence. Um, one student asked about the influence of magic realism on this particular book and all of your work. Well, you see, as I was trying to say, the magic realists were influenced by the same material that I was influenced by. So if you look at it, the source material goes back to the same source. Now, my view is that the, the term, there's two things wrong with the term magic realism. I mean, one is that I think it has a real meaning when you use it to talk about a group of writers in South America um, from the mid-50s to the mid-70s, because you know, that, that was a, an extraordinary flowering of genius, and uh, realismo magico was a phrase that they used themselves to describe what they were doing, and it applies to them. The term is, in my view, absolutely identical to, for example, surrealism, which had its origins in France, to fabulism, which was used about American literature in the 1970s, writers like Thomas Pynchon and Donald Bartholomew and so on. Um, this kind of writing, writing which departs from, um, from naturalism, mm -hmm. um, is, is something which exists in every culture at different moments. And you could say, you know, Kafka, Kafka's Metamorphosis, is magic realism. Um, Gogol's nose is magic realism. Um, Diderot's Jack the Fatalist is magic realism. This, this, the term ceases to be useful. What there is is another tradition in literature which is, to me, more interesting than the naturalistic tradition, yeah. which, which is a tradition of invention and which shows the ming which uses a technique which mingles the fantastic with the observable. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean, I grew up surrounded, surrounded by that. Try going to see an Indian movie. You, know? <laughs> um, you, don't, you can't escape that combination of the fabulous and the everyday. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I recognized in magic realism many things that I knew about from home. And so it's a kind of synergy, is what I'd say. 
Um, I mean, I remember when I wrote my first book, I had never read any of this Latin American material. Um, and a friend of mine said to me that I had obviously been enormously influenced by it. And I said, well, who are these people? Uh, and he said, you should go today to a bookstore and buy this book called 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I remember saying, 100 years of solitude? <laughs> that, that's a book I should read? And he said, look, just don't be an idiot, go buy it. <laughs> so I did, and of course, the moment you start reading that book, it, it's a kind of uh, one of the great experiences of modern literature. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I did fall in love with it, and I suppose it did have some effect on, on how I wrote, but what I'm saying is that this kind of writing had come at me anyway, you know, before, and I just recognized in Garcia Marquez a kind of grand master at work yeah. in that field. You and I um, had a conversation about music, and that has me wonder about any non-literary influences. I know you're a huge uh, fan of certain musicians and cinema, and wondering if you could talk about how that enters into well, your I mean, creation. Yeah, I mean, in a number of ways, I think mm -hmm. is the answer. I think one, one is that, as I said, I do tend to think musically about prose, so that I, I will quite often focus on the music of a line as well as the meaning of a line, because I think if you actually shift the music of the line, you can shift the meaning of it. If you make it less lyrical, more staccato, it's doing something different. And so I will very often think about what music a sentence needs to have in order to better communicate what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. So there's that general sense. And then, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm unfortunately or fortunately a child of the 60s. You know, I was 21 in 1968. I was 20 in the summer of love. <laughs> These were good things to be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, there I was at the Cambridge University at the world apogee of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> and I mean, unlike President Clinton, I might have inhaled accidentally. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, that's, that's, that's had an effect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I sleep a lot. <laughs> you nod. That's one of the things that happens to you. You nod a lot. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. So that doesn't help, right? Then, yeah. But then I, so I do have, you know, I, I grow up with that, your generation's music is the music that sticks in your head. And, and then I was lucky enough, which helped me when I was writing The Ground Beneath Her Feet, just that over the years I've, I've actually known just a lot of musicians, mm -hmm. which gave me the confidence of trying to make some up. Mm. You know? And then I had the good fortune of you know, writing a song with you too, which not everybody gets to do. <laughs> or at least I didn't actually write it with them. I wrote in The Ground Beneath Her Feet, there's a character who's a songwriter. And so I thought, it, the, I mean, it was a, one of the more difficult decisions about that book was, I thought, well, if you've got a character who's a songwriter, at some point you've got to suggest what songs he writes. <laughs> and, and so I had to invent lyrics for songs that didn't exist. And one of those songs in the novel is a song called The Ground Beneath Her Feet, which is a sad love song. It's a song written by him in memory of his, the woman he loves who has died in an earthquake. The ground beneath her feet has opened and killed her. And anyway, so that lyric is in the novel. And when I finished the novel, I wanted to make sure I hadn't made stupid mistakes mm. about the music industry. Um, so I sent the book to a few friends just to say, tell me where the blunders are so I can fix them. And, and one of the people I sent it to was was the lead singer of U2, and, and, uh, and he called me up and said... You're talking about Bono. Yeah, but yes, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yes, his, his, his name just slipped my mind for a minute. <laughs> um, but uh, and he called me up and he said, he said, so I read your, only I read your novel, and you know the title track, 
I said, I, I said, Bono, I didn't know that novels had title tracks, but, but <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, I've, I've, written, I've written a melody, and I think it's very good. So then I had to go to Dublin, because he wouldn't send me a CD. I had to go to Dublin so I could hear the title track. And actually, it was very sweet, because he was kind of, he was shy, and he, he wanted me to listen to it separately from when the other members of the band and all weren't there. So I had to go and sit in his car <laughs> uh, for him to put the CD in, you know. Now, I have to tell you, the sound system in Bono's car <laughs> is not like the sound system in your car. <laughs> in fact, if you open the trunk, it's all sound system, you know. So, anyway, so he sat there and he made me listen to it three times. I actually liked it the first time, but he thought, I was, he, th he thought that I was, you know, lying. And so he made me listen, and only after he thought that I actually liked it were we able to go into the house for him to play it to everyone else. And then they recorded it, and you know, so I had a song on a U2 album, and I got to go to gigs where they're playing my song. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't happen to every novelist. <laughs> so. This is my last question. Yeah. In response to recent events, you said we must all defend the art of satire, which has always been a force for liberty and against tyranny and dishonesty. And my last question is, what value do you place on your imagination in that fight? I don't know, I mean, uh, it's for other people to say, really. You know, I mean, my view is not all my books, I would not, I would not describe all my books as falling into the category of satire, mm -hmm. you know, um, but some of them do. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think my novel, Shame, yeah. which I wrote after Midnight's Children, is probably the most directly political, satirical novel that I ever wrote. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty harsh, the satire in it, you know. Um, but it's a book that I'm proud of, and I think, oddly, a quarter of a century later, it feels almost more contemporary than when I wrote it, because of the way the world has gone. Um, as I say, I mean, I, it's satire like, I mean, if you're a writer, it's kind of like if you're a composer, you have an orchestra to compose for, you know? And sometimes you, write more for the strings and sometimes more for the keyboard and you, know, you you don't have to write the same thing every time you compose and the sa it's in the same way when you're writing you don't always write for the same part of the orchestra mm -hmm. you know and and so satire is one of the tools and it's a very important one mm -hmm. and actually in the history of France it's been enormously important ever since the French Revolution um, some of the first really powerful satirical pieces in French history uh, were feuilleton, the sheets that were distributed in the street, attacking Marie Antoinette after she encouraged people to eat cake, which was really bad for their health. Um, so there was a, a kind of you know, early gluten-free satire. <laughs> uh, at, at that time. Uh, <laughs> but the French satirical tradition has always been very pointed and very harsh, mm. and um, still is, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, the thing, the thing that I really r resent is the way in which these are dead comrades, you know, these people who died using the same implement that I use, which is a pen or right. a pencil, um, have been almost immediately vilified and called racists and I don't know what else. You know, um, which is a which is a, a dreadful crime against their memory, um, and I mean I didn't know them well, but I met Stéphane Charbonnier, um, the editor mm -hmm. of Charlie who who less racist than whom it would be hard to find somebody. First thought he was I mean there might be other things wrong with him he was a communist. <laughs> <laughs> he was a communist member of the far left in France, so to describe him as a right winger is a bizarre distortion. Um, but, you know, Charlie Hebdo attacked everything. It attacked 
Muslims, it attacked the Pope, it attacked the Israel and rabbis, it attacked black people and white people and gay people and straight people. It attacked every kind of human being because what? It was making fun. Its strategy was to make fun of people. And it was seen as that, it was seen as that. It was very loved. These cartoonists were beloved in France. Wolinsky, the old gentleman, 87 years old, he was the grand old man of French culture. Um, anyway, so I, the thing that I've come to, I mean, I used this phrase on television the other day, with the, 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 the rise of the, what I call the butt brigade. I've got so sick of the goddamn butt brigade. And now the moment somebody says, yes, I believe in free speech, but I stop listening. Mm. No. Yes. You know, I believe in free speech, but people should behave themselves. Mm -hmm. I believe in free speech, but we shouldn't upset anybody. I believe in free speech, but let's not go too far. The point about it is the moment you limit free speech, it's not free speech. Mm -hmm. The point about it is that it's free. Both John F. Kennedy and Nelson Mandela, in important speeches, use the same three words phrase, which, which to my mind says it all. Freedom is indivisible. You can't slice it up, mm -hmm. otherwise it ceases to be freedom. And you can dislike Charlie Hebdo, you know, not all their drawings are funny. Um, you can dislike, but the fact that you dislike them has got nothing to do with their right to speak. The fact that you dislike them certainly doesn't in any way excuse their murder. And the idea that within days of this murder, sections of the left as well as the right have turned against these, these fallen artists to vilify them is, I think, disgraceful. Yeah. With that, thank you.